Okay, welcome to the show, everybody. My name's James Faulkner. I'm the editor of Master Investor. I'm here with Lord Lee of Trafford. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to have you here. Um, as many of you probably know, Lord Lee is famous uh, for being the first recorded ISA millionaire in the UK. He's also the author of several investment books, including How to Make a Million Slowly, which I can say um, from experience is probably one of the best and most easy to read books on investing I've ever come across. <clears throat> so, John, um, you've seen quite a few bear markets in your time. Um, how does the, the bear market of 2020 compare with um, the ones that, that have come before it? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, every bear market has its own features. Um, but, um, you know, the one thing that you do learn in a long investment life uh, is that um, uh, events can come along from left field, which can totally knock the market. Uh, I mean, I remember, for example, in um, going back to the 19... 70s uh, when I was investing uh, the market fell and this was the the time of the secondary banking crash and um, prices fell uh, blue chips so-called blue chips yielding about 20 percent then and no one buy. Uh, and so when you've been through that sort of period as I as I did fairly early on in my investment life you realize that events like that can happen um, uh, and the one thing that it, it taught me right at the start was never to invest on borrowed money uh, because you know, the stock market can fall uh, and you really don't need a bank or similar pressing you to repay. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the pandemic uh, that hit us very recently, uh, it, it, once again, is a, it was a totally unexpected event. Uh, but you know, if one was invested in, in fundamentally strong stock, decent companies, genuine businesses uh, that were um, geared uh, and on realistic ratios and at that stage will pay dividends and no doubt we'll talk about dividends separately. Um, provided you're patient uh, and, uh, and uh, you can take the long view, uh, then you stay broad brush, you stay put. Uh, and this is what I've done uh, and uh, I've topped up certain holdings um, move one or two others as well, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but fundamentally, my, my uh, approach hasn't changed, uh, and I'm very much a long term investor uh, and stay put. Uh, you know, I don't believe that one should take extreme investment positions like think it's time to cash in and sell everything or, or, or really the converse. And obviously, you, you're quite well known for um, taking an interest in many smaller companies. And a lot of the smaller companies have been hit quite hard by by COVID nineteen. Um, I just wonder what your your assessment is of the state of the the small cap market at the moment, and what what the the particular implications uh, of COVID nineteen have been for the small cap market in relation to the you know the blue chip stocks and th that kind of thing. Well, I have to say that I, I've always favoured. Uh, small cap stocks for for a whole host of reasons, uh, uh, and actually the ones the the, the, the ones that I I'm in um, uh, companies like uh, if I can mention some names companies like Concurrent Technologies, Lock and Store, Lock and Store, and Pario Treat. Um, they it's really an, uh, they've held up pretty well and um, you know, not only paid dividends but actually increase their dividends so uh, you know my core small cap holdings um, have actually held up pretty well um, but the mistakes I've made more recently uh, going back a few weeks w was to invest very heavily in, in a legal and general and Aviva on seven and a half percent yields which I thought right. was a very good place <laughs> to, to park money uh, uh, but of course uh, Aviva then uh, deferred uh, uh, deferred its dividend uh, and uh, that held sector uh, the large financials slumped, uh, so it wasn't the the cleverest of moves. Although recently, the the three sisters, as I call them, Aviva, Legal and General, and M and G, both have started to stage some sort of recovery because I believe that they're fundamentally undervalued. Um, 
talking about dividends, um, you, you you wrote a piece in the FT at the weekend um, and discussing the fact that you know a lot of dividends have been cut across the board, um, and obviously that's terrible news for for investors who rely on dividend income to help fund the retirement. Um, I can't help but wondering though. Um, the UK market has been a bit of an outlier in terms of the, the dividend yield, what it pays to investors for quite some time now. And is, is there a sense that many UK companies perhaps have not been investing enough in, in the, their businesses and, and have been paying too much to, um, to investors in, in the form of dividends? Um, and is, 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 in a sense, is... is um, are these dividend cuts necessary to sort of rebalance things in for UK PLC? Do you think there's any any truth in that? Yeah, I think there are I think there are a number of points there. Um, first of all, I think it's probably accepted now uh, as a generalisation that UK companies have been paying out too much at the expense of dividend cover. Uh, I think that's probably probably accepted now. Uh, and when uh, the majority of dividends do restart again. Uh, I expect them to be from a lower base level, and I would imagine that the the cover dividend cover would be somewhat higher. Mm. Uh, now, having said that, I have to say that I have been very disappointed with the boards of some companies uh, who uh, have have deferred or, or cancelled their their dividends, um, almost taking advantage, frankly, of the of the you know the pandemic well, uncertainty. Uh, now, I entirely accept and entirely support, totally support, boards uh, of companies who've really been struggling to get through this period uh, to preserve the business um, so that it survives and, and comes through and prospers. And if they've had to cancel the dividend uh, or defer, that I totally understand. Uh, but I do feel that uh, a number of companies, uh, and I criticise Nichols, uh, the, the BIMTO, soft drinks uh, manufacturer in the press, um, other companies that could easily have paid their dividend um, uh, have decided to, uh, um, uh, to take, I think, to take advantage of the, of the situation to some extent and almost um, uh, gain a dividend holiday. Uh, and uh, as you rightly say, there are many uh, retired investors who are reliant on that dividend income um, there are many charities that are reliant on that dividend income. Uh, many elderly investors, for example, you know, rely on dividend income to help pay their care home fees. So it's not clever to, to cut dividends where companies can actually maintain. Uh, and I think the pity is that uh, one or two of those who deferred totally for the time being didn't actually maybe pay half uh, now or at the appropriate time. Uh, and then maybe later on in the year, uh, when the the, the, the situated economic situation is a little clearer, uh, maybe you would have paid that second half. Yeah. Uh, but if you take Shell, for example, uh, which has had an, an impeccable dividend record over 30 years, uh, yes, one accepts that um, uh, the price of oil is very low, uh, that there's economic uncertainty, uh, they've got um, you know, considerable expiration costs ahead of them uh, as they ch try to move the business away uh, into more um, uh, you know, green source of energy and, and similar. Uh, so a dividend cut was not totally surprising, but uh, query, did they need to actually reduce the dividend by two thirds? Uh, I would have thought that maybe uh, trimming it by a third or possibly a half would have been fine, but did they need to actually trim it by two thirds? It, was a, it seemed to me to be a rather extreme decision, given that most analysts believe that Shell had enough cash to actually pay the whole dividend if they'd wanted to. Um, so I think what I'm urging boards to do at the present time is to really be as frank as possible with investors about dividend policy going forward. Um, the sort of dividend cover that they, they're looking to maintain, uh, when they're planning to, to decide on dividends. I mean, if you take Aviva, for example, uh, with half a million investors, many of them very small investors, um, they, they declared a dividend. Then under some pressure, they decided to, to, uh, uh, to defer it. And all they've said to investors is, we'll, we'll reconsider the dividend decision uh, in the final quarter of the year. So at the moment, 
all those of Viva investors, including myself, have no idea whether a dividend is going to be paid this year, at what rate uh, and when. Uh, and so I do think uh, responsible boards, indeed all boards, ought to try and be as frank as possible with shareholders so we know where we stand. Mm. And of course, the, the picture isn't as uh, as grim um, in all parts of the market. And I was just looking um, at a company this morning, SNU, which is one of your favourites from, from the past. Um, they have maintained their dividend in the face of COVID-19. Um, it's, it's a family owned business. And I was wondering, is there a sense that um, some of these um, companies where the, the family shareholding is quite significant, they, they're actually more resilient to, to these kind of downturns, not least because many of the family members rely on that source of dividend income. Um, give us a bit of an insight into your, your thoughts on, on that. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. And I've written about this on, on many occasions. Um, I've done very well over the years in investing in, in what I term proprietorial companies or, or family companies, where the family have a, a big stake in the in the ongoing business uh, and in that type of company and once again you know you can quote examples the other way um, but in those companies the characteristic is one of carefully stewarding the business uh, conscious of previous generations who built it up and conscious also of um, future generations uh, and also very very conscious of uh, family shareholders like say maiden aunts who uh, have, have significant shareholdings of the business um, but no salary uh, but are reliant on those dividends mm -hmm. so that type of conservative family control PLC uh, I like very much indeed and, and you know they've served me in good stead having said that I have to say that was or is one of the characteristics of Nichols uh, which was a considerable disappointment to me and to many others when they uh, deferred their dividend despite uh, uh, telling us that uh, they had 40 million pounds in the bank uh, and were very confident about about coming through this um, this pandemic uh, crisis so uh, i'm hopeful that, that they will uh, reinstate a dividend uh, later in the year so you can never be absolutely sure but as a characteristic i like those family businesses yeah. or more uh, uh, and just going on uh, almost as a, as, a, as a parallel to that. I really don't want to invest and don't invest in businesses where the people running the business uh, haven't got stakes in it. I like to see uh, those uh, who, who are running the business uh, with, a, uh, with a significant stake, not just incentivized by share options, but actually investing real money in it. So, uh, you know, I like businesses like uh, uh, Lock and Store, for example, in, in Safe Storage, where um, uh, Andrew Jacobs, who's the chief executive, has got 20 odd percent of it, or, or Cerulean uh, in services to the telecom sector. Um, he's got, uh, you know, probably, you know, 30 percent plus. Um, those are the businesses that, that I like, and those are the characteristics that appeal to me. Give us a flavour of, uh, of how your, your own portfolio has fared during this, uh, this crisis, John. Well, I took, I took a, a, a big hit at the start of it um, because, as I indicated, um, you know, I, I invested quite a lot of the surplus cash that I had and built up from uh, two takeovers last year, Charles Taylor and Tarsus, uh, in the beavers of this world, uh, and then was badly let down when it deferred its dividend and, uh, you know, the share price plummeted. Uh, so I took a hit there. Uh, and indeed a double whammy because uh, Air Partner, the Air Charter Broker, which is also one of my uh, favourites and larger holdings, uh, also hit turbulence uh, because I think it was regarded by some investors as a, an airline stock, which is not. Uh, and also um, uh, a substantial institutional holder was actually, um, uh, was actually um, uh, selling uh, and unloading shares. So the air partner shares slumped to 17p, 
So at the start of this pandemic, um, you know, I was hit by those double whammies, the, the fall in, big fall in Aviva and the big slump in, in Air Partner. Um, now, thankfully, um, uh, people have realized that Air Partner is not uh, a typical airline and indeed has been doing extremely well. Uh, it's an ill wind in this situation, uh, involved in many organizing repatriation flights of individuals uh, and also flying a lot of um, uh, protective equipment around the world for the NHS and, and, and similar. And their shares have rebounded from 17p to, to around 75, 76p today. Uh, and uh, Aviva has started to move up as well. Um, so uh, that, that obviously has brought about a recovery in my overall value. But my core holdings, as I indicated earlier, the, these uh, outstanding small cap stocks, uh, the Concurrents, the Emparios, the Lock and Stores, the Cerulean's uh, Treat, which is my biggest holding, they've all held up pretty well, and um, uh, you know, and, and I believe are, are, are great little businesses which will deliver in the future. Were you brave, uh, or indeed lucky enough, to uh, make any purchases right at the depths of the crisis? Um, well, I wouldn't say absolutely at the at the depths because uh, I normally am fairly fully invested anyway so i didn't have the surplus uh, liquidity to to actually go in right at the bottom i tended to hold most of my holdings and be fairly fully invested but i did pick up some as the new holding some uh, jarvis securities which is a stockbroking firm uh, that also um, uh, carries out some administration functions for pension funds on a six percent yield uh, and then there's a board trading statement so that's moved ahead quite nicely so that was a a new purchase of uh, of mine, uh, and also I, you know, I did top up on on M and G, uh, which I think is significantly undervalued, mm -hmm. and also added to um, one or two of my smaller stocks, like uh, uh, like Ampario, for example, um, which uh, which I do believe in. Okay, and um, to finish off, I'm I'm not going to ask you for a, a stock tip as such, but. Are there any companies out there right now that you think might um, might be worth further investigation um, on part of listeners? Well, uh, let me answer the, the question this way. Um, I've just had a, a friendly challenge. We call it the Richmond Challenge with a, uh, a neighbour of mine who's an ex-investment banker. And he is a great believer in, in uh, large tech stocks. So um, we've had a... a, a competition a challenge um, and he's uh, selected his five and they are things like uh, Scottish Mortgage and Thunsmith um, uh, the the, the um, uh, you know the the bigger uh, the bigger cap stocks with with, with a fair number of um, technology holdings within uh, and I've um, set against his five my small cap favorites uh, which are, and you know, to repeat again, uh, Ampario, Concurrent Technologies, Cerulean, Lock and Store, and Treat. Uh, and um, we, we draw the line in three years for uh, one case of wine for the, for the winner, and in five years, two cases of wine. <laughs> so we'll see how those go. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but all I know is that those five are my my favourites at the moment, um, you know, which I believe will will perform and uh, uh, and deliver. Um, but we all make mistakes. We all get things wrong. Um, you know, no one has a perfect system. But uh, uh, you know, I, I've uh, been investing now for probably sixty years. So hopefully, one's learned something. Uh, and of course, the key is to to be patient. Not enough people are patient. They chop and change and to avoid the losses. That is terribly important. So, uh, you know, I don't get involved in, in speculative stocks. I don't get involved in exploration stocks or biotech stocks or startups. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of money can be made in those areas, but they're for the specialists. I tend to go for businesses that are already established, already profitable, already paying dividends, uh, and um, uh, building a portfolio long-term, as I've tried to do brick by brick. Well, best of luck in the uh, the Richmond Challenge, John, and I hope you're toasting your success in due course. <laughs> I'll share the wine with you if you make up to <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks very much for your time today, John.
Take care. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.